the art of swordsmanship in the latter part of the 20th century. A pair of Olympic fencers, armed with feather-light foils, confront each other with the coolness and precision of chess players. They wear masks and protective clothing. Their weapons are blunt and pliable. The attacks available to them are restrained by rules, conventions and etiquette. Looking at swordplay of this sort, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the sport of fencing has its roots in mortal combat, in desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which would result in bloodshed, mutilation and violent death. In this film, we shall look at European swords and at their use not on the battlefield, but in personal conflict. And we shall examine some of the ways in which the skills of swordsmanship changed and developed over a period of 300 years. From the heavily armed combat of the late Middle Ages to the formal and often highly stylized sword play practiced in the academies of the 18th century. sword is probably the most ancient, wrote the French fencing master Labat. It is worn by kings and princes as an ornament to majesty and grandeur. It distinguishes the nobility from the lower rank of men. The sword carried by the knights of the 14th and 15th centuries generally weighed between two and three pounds. It had a simple cross guard to protect the hand and a heavy pommel at the top of the grip to help counterbalance the weight of the blade. The blade was generally broad with sharp edges which tapered to a point. The broad blade gave the sword the weight necessary for it to be effective as a cutting weapon. A two-handed sword could even be swung like a hammer, making use of the crossguard. The sword of this period was designed both for cutting and for thrusting, the point of the blade making it possible for it to be forced between the plates of an enemy's armor. Until the late Middle Ages, the sword was essentially a military weapon carried by men-at-arms. During the 15th century, however, the custom began to arise of wearing a sword in everyday life. These civilian swords, cross-hilted and broad-bladed, were more or less similar to those carried by knights in battle. When, in warfare, swords were carried by foot soldiers, they were sometimes used in combination with a small shield, known as a buckler. As distinctive civilian styles of sword fighting developed, the buckler remained a natural companion to the sword, and one which was to continue to be in use until the end of the 16th century. The function of the buckler was not to absorb the impact of the sword blow, but to deflect it to one side. As an extension of the fist, it could be used to deliver a weighty and damaging punch. Effective though the buckler was, it was not obviously something which a man would normally be carrying around with him. A dagger, however, was. In the 15th and 16th centuries, most men, regardless of their social status, would wear a dagger. The dagger, apart from being employed as an attacking weapon, could be used to parry or block a sword blow. In the early 16th century, the custom of carrying a sword having become well established, the techniques of swordsmanship began to be studied and taught 
in a fairly systematic fashion. One of the first and most influential theorists in this field was Achille Morozzo, an Italian, whose great work on the subject, the Opera Nova, was published in 1536. In this book, he lays down a number of guards or postures to be adopted by the swordsman. These are not guards in the sense that they offer real protection for any part of the body. Rather, they are launching positions for delivering an attack. Although with Morozzo we see the beginning of a codified and systematic form of sword fighting, the techniques employed were still somewhat free for all and could include kicking, tripping and barging. A feature of swordsmanship in Morozzo's time was that attacks were executed on the pass with a walking rather than a lunging movement. The reason we're able to analyze the theories of Morozzo and later sword masters is that these teachers, taking advantage of improved printing techniques, all wrote detailed and well-illustrated manuals, which, judging from the fact that they were all reprinted several times, must have been best-selling volumes. It was characteristic of the Renaissance that men of learning like Michelangelo and Leonardo should be interested in the various forms of combat. For swordsmanship, like music, dance, mathematics, architecture, anatomy and astronomy, was believed to conform to universal rules and to be an indispensable part of a gentleman's education. By the middle of the 16th century, the civilian sword, which had begun to be known as a rapier, had undergone subtle changes. New designs had emerged, dictated in part by shifts in fighting technique and partly by considerations of fashion. It's clear when you look at portraits of the period that by the 16th century, the sword had become an indispensable costume accessory to the man of wealth and taste. The most elaborate hilts were developed with complex and often highly ornate forms of hand defense. It was, however, not hilts, but blades which determined the changing styles of fighting technique. Where Morozzo and his contemporaries had been using a broad-bladed weapon, not unlike that used in battle, by the late 16th century, lighter, narrower blades had evolved, sometimes over a metre in length, and these gave rise to entirely new forms of swordsmanship. It became increasingly common for the sword to be used without a companion weapon, and as this became the norm, so there was a natural shift in the swordsman's stance. Instead of approaching each other frontally, swordsmen now tended to meet sideways on, with the left foot falling behind the right, and the left arm, now free, used to help the swordsman keep his balance. Whilst for centuries, swords had been used for thrusting as well as for cutting, as the 16th century gave way to the 17th, more and more emphasis began to be placed on the thrust. This led to the development of the lunge, in which the right foot is advanced as the sword arm thrusts forward. The freeing of the left hand allowed it to be used for deflecting an opponent's sword arm, or even for wresting his sword from his hand. The trend towards longer and lighter blades sometimes led to the adoption of flimsy and ineffective weapons, and was often the subject of condemnation. Among those who opposed the Italian school, was an English master of fence called George Silver. Silver, championing an older broadsword style of fighting, set out in the strongest terms to attack Italian theories and techniques. His book, Paradoxes of Defense, was, he said, an admirable, noble, ancient, victorious, valiant, 
defence around it remained very much a pragmatic affair. If suddenly attacked, a man had to defend himself as best he could. And when out in the street, his cloak, as well as his sword, might offer him protection. This use of the cloak is a continuation of the tradition of using the rapier with a companion weapon. It's a reminder of the fact that, in a life or death situation, a swordsman would do whatever he could to defend himself. An instance of fighting in earnest, as against theoretical swordplay. Until well into the 17th century, writing on the subject of swordsmanship tended to be dominated by Italians. The peak of achievement in this tradition was the work of a master of fence called Capo Ferro, whose manual, the Gran Simulacro, was published in 1610. Whilst in this book, Capo Ferro illustrates the use of the sword in combination with both the dagger and the cloak, he does much to advance the technique of fighting with the rapier alone. Previous theorists had favoured an approach in which the two opponents move in a circular fashion. Capo Ferro breaks this pattern by encouraging the swordsman to attack along a straight line, placing emphasis on speed of response and on the thrust rather than the cut. These principles were to be of lasting importance. The next phase in the development of swords and swordsmanship occurred a generation or so later, and it came not from Italy, but from France. In a manner characteristic of the age of Louis XIV, the French school of swordsmanship in the 17th century was poised, elegant, and highly formalized. It was the French, for example, who devised the ritual of saluting one's adversary before setting about the serious business of killing him. And it was in France, during the 1630s and 40s, that a new form of rapier emerged, with a shorter and much lighter blade. This weapon, which became known as a small sword, was rapidly adopted in fashionable circles. From the mid-17th century, the French school of fence, with its light, narrow-bladed sword, its codified etiquette, and its precisely calculated thrusts and parries, dominated the whole of Europe. The small sword, which in the 18th century continued to be the preferred weapon for the man of fashion, typically had a blade only two-thirds the length of capo ferros. It also had a smaller and simpler form of hilt, usually with two solid shells to protect the fingers. Both hilt and blade tended to be decorated, however, and the sword remained a highly prized item of personal adornment and a means of wealthy display, without which like the snuff box, no gentleman's wardrobe would be complete. An effect of reducing the weight of the sword blade was that it could become flimsy. To help counteract this, it became increasingly common for the blade to be made with a triangular cross-section. This meant that, whilst it could bend, it still remained relatively rigid. 
The temper of the blade, in the view of one 18th century expert, is to be tried by bending it against anything. A good blade will generally form half a circle to within a foot of the shell and spring back again. Those which are stubborn in the bending are badly tempered, often break, and very easily. The pliable hollow ground blade was most recommended for its lightness and ease in the handling. There continued, however, particularly in Britain, to be a parallel tradition, a civilian version of current military practice, which favoured the spadroon, a single-edged form of broadsword. This was essentially a cutting rather than a thrusting weapon, and it was used in much the same way as the single sword of Morozzo's time, or the Elizabethan broadsword of George Silver, with the left hand placed on the hip to counterbalance the weight of the blade. The approach, on the other hand, was very much an 18th century one, with the swordsman fighting along a straight line. Whilst this heavier bladed weapon remained popular among soldiers and among travellers, in society it was the small sword and the French style which prevailed, even among the chauvinistic English. And the great master of the 18th century, a gentleman named Angelo, a man of Italian origin but trained in the French tradition, founded an aristocratic fencing academy in London, which was to endure for more than a century and a half. In the art of fencing, wrote Angelo, much depends on quickness of sight, agility in the wrist, a staunchness in the parades or parries, and keeping a solid firmness in the centrical motion of the body when a thrust is made. To be flexible in the whole frame, not to abandon yourself or flutter. A man who wears a sword without knowing how to use it is full as ridiculous as a man who carries books about with him without knowing how to read. It's quite clear, however, from contemporary accounts of Angelo's school that what was being taught was less a practical system of self-defense than a highly formal gentlemanly accomplishment in which elegance and poise were considered to be as important as they were in the minuet. Swordsmanship, in the highly formal context of the academy, had acquired the status of a civilized recreational pursuit, with emphasis, in Angelo's words, on confidence and grace. Sword play had been established as a quite distinct form of swordsmanship and the foundations laid for the sport of fencing. We know, for example, from the illustrations to Angelo's manual, The School of Fencing, that practice was conducted not with the small sword, but with light, square-sectioned foils with a button on the tip to prevent accidental injury. There was no exercise, it was said, that conduces so much as fencing to strengthen and supple the parts and to give the body an easy and graceful appearance. It justly forms part of the education of persons of rank. Paradoxically, it was at the end of the 18th century, at the point when swords and swordsmanship had reached a peak of excellence, that the custom of wearing a sword began to fall into disfavour with it the practice of dueling with swords, the true and right gentlemanly weapon being abandoned in favour of the now lethally accurate pistol. When duels with swords were fought in earnest, as clearly they were, despite the fact that in both England and France they had been declared illegal since the 17th century, they were generally very different from the gentlemanly exchanges of the academy. Courtesies put to one side they tended to be unceremonious, brief and bloody. <laughs> 